are all in this together And nothing can remind us Like a simple act of kindness Hey! And in the blackest of night hey. Just one flash of light hey. Shows we're not alone No, not today It is time Let's do this It's our time Let's do this It is time To shine a light Let's do this It is time To shine your light So beautiful. Thank you. So this wonderful dancer is also going to be our MC today. And uh, Sofia Salengaros is one of the many young people uh, who've been helping, volunteering for Asia initiatives for years. And they are one of our big strengths. And uh, Sofia is not just a great dancer, but she's also headed to medical school. And she's going to be a dancing doctor. Uh, so let me welcome everyone who's joining us today. Thank you very much uh, for our first ever virtual gala. We are so excited to have you here. Uh, I'm Gita Mehta. I founded Asia Initiatives 21 years ago in Japan where I lived with my family. And uh, since then we have, uh, with the help of many of you and our wonderful staff and volunteers, we've been able to uh, impact positively the life of over 50,000 women in India, Ghana, Kenya, and United States. And uh, um, my best part of this journey is when I actually go to the field sites and I get to meet with and work with local people that we are trying to help uh, because I learn so much from their strength, their resilience, their creativity and their uh, hope that they have uh, and enthusiasm with which they do the projects that we do with them. Uh, so that's like the highlight, uh, one of the highlights of my life. I want to now uh, uh, give a big uh, welcome back uh, to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And he's a great supporter for Asia Initiatives. We are really blessed for that. He's actually joined us at our galas for the last uh, this is the fourth year, and uh, this time he is joining us virtually from uh, South Korea. And his work at the United Nations for empowering women was so powerful that we instituted an award in his honor. It's called the Ban Ki-moon Award for Women's Empowerment. And I'm delighted to tell you that this year's recipient is Dr. Jane Goodall. She's a renowned ethnologist and environmentalist and humanist that I think you, you may already know her work. But she's actually joining us today from UK. And that's the magic of uh, virtual galas that we, we have these wonderful people with us today. Uh, so um, we will have a chance to speak with them later. Uh, but let me also take this opportunity to really thank our co-chairs, Anime Feige and Kratma Saini Sood, who worked tremendously hard and made this event possible. I also want to tell you about a wonderful surprise we have towards the end of the gala. Uh, it is uh, Ricky Cage, who's our 
uh, ambassador, Goodwill Ambassador, he will be performing for us. So with that, let me hand over the mic to Sophia, our MC. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Gita. It's such a privilege for me to work with Asia Initiatives. Welcome again to everyone. We have a great program lined up for you. The theme for our program today is connecting the dots between health, nature, and our common humanity, a subject so critical at this time in history. You will hear our very special guest, Hode, talk about this. There is a saying that you make a living by getting something, but you make a life by giving something. So I would now like to bring to your attention the donate button on our website at any time for information about any of our projects and contribute there using the donate button as well. Asia Initiatives is a 501c3 registered charity, so all your contributions are tax deductible and will go directly to support our projects. We appreciate your generosity. Now let us take a quick look at how Asia Initiatives has been working hard to support and empower the lives of many women with whom we work with in India, Kenya, and the United States. Asia Initiative strives to support women and their families to create lasting, sustainable change and become active participants in their own bright future. With that in mind, we developed our groundbreaking methodology, Social Capital Credit SOCKS. SOCKS are a real hyper-local and community-driven initiative. So people come together and there are days of dialogue when people just say what they need and what are they willing to do towards it. Socks are transacted through our SOC app and SOC platform. And where these electronic devices don't exist, people use SOC books, which are like bank books where your socks are recorded and what you redeemed is recorded. We believe that dignity is the most important part of development and that local people should express their own choices on the what, when, and how of development. The implementation of SOCs starts with Socratic dialogues we hold with communities in India, Ghana, Kenya, and the United States, making community stakeholders in their own success. Most people, and especially women, say that this is the first time ever that they've been asked to be a part of the development process instead of being told what to do. They've also developed leadership skills and begun to set and achieve substantial goals. SOX helps families increase both human and financial capital. It's simple. People do social good and earn SOX for their work. They can redeem socks for tangible goods or services that help support and develop their communities and families. Many of our women have now become more confident and improved their incomes and standing in their communities. Some of them have been elected to their local governments. Children are also able to earn socks for activities such as teaching younger kids and participating in awareness campaigns. Socks has enabled Asia initiatives to implement over 18 projects in three continents. Through our projects, we have facilitated water conservation and the growth of sustainable agriculture, empowered craftswomen through opportunities for financial independence, and help access credit, healthcare, education, technology, and help students learn employable skills for a better future to achieve sustainable development, become more resilient, and to ignite the light within. I hope that this film shed some light on our work. I now invite Dr. Gita Mehta to host the conversation with our honored guests. Asia Initiatives is so honored to have with us today two preeminent thought leaders of our time. 
they are both so well known that I really don't think they need an introduction, but let me just say that uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon headed the United Nations from 2007 to 2016. He was the force behind the development of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, and also the establishment of UN Women. In honor of his amazing work for women, Asia Initiatives instituted the Ban Ki-moon Award for Women's Empowerment four years ago. We are so thrilled that the recipient for this year's award is Dr. Jane Goodall, the renowned ethnologist, environmentalist, and humanist. She has broken so many glass ceilings since she started work, uh, work in uh, Gombe in Tanzania when she was just 23 years old. We will learn more from our esteemed guest today about the theme of our gala, which is connecting the dots between health, nature, and our common humanity. So um, let me start with you, Secretary General. During your term at the United Nations, uh, Dr. Goodall was the UN Messenger of Peace. How does her work relate to the important work you have been doing? Now you uh, briefly asked me uh, how I, how do I, uh, how this uh, relate to the important work you have done, uh, I have done at the United Nations. I have had the opportunity to work with you, with Dr. Kudal frequently. I have always been struck by uh, Dr. Kudal's brilliance, uh, coupled with her very humble nature. Uh, she is a unique human being who loves animals. She is a fierce protector of our natural world. And she is a champion of uh, women's rights. So it is a perfect uh, choice for the Asia Initiative uh, to recognize her lifelong uh, commitment for women's rights. As a UN messenger of peace, she has also played a pioneer, pioneering role in highlighting our increasingly fragile ecosystems mm -hmm. and serving as a unique role model uh, for the empowerment of women for 18 years up to today, but I think continue. She's still uh, continuing. Uh, this is what uh, I'd like to make a brief uh, remarks uh, before we also uh, engage in a dialogue. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I want to pick up on the last thing you said, uh, Secretary General. You said that she's such a fierce champion for the environment and to, uh, for the fact that we are not the only living beings here. We are, the world is so wonderful with so many, uh, so many uh, living things. Uh, so I want to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Goodall that you have actually said that uh, COVID-19 pandemic is perhaps a good example of nature striking back. Mm -hmm. I, I want you to talk about that. In part, this pandemic for one thing, it's been predicted for years and years and years mm -hmm. by those people studying zoonotic diseases, that's diseases that spill from an animal to a person. Mm -hmm. um, but also it comes from our disrespect of the natural world and animals. And, you know, we have been always putting economic development before protecting the natural world. We are part of the natural world, we depend on it. And as we continue to destroy it, we're also destroying the future of our children. So what's been happening? We've been, for example, destroying a rainforest. The species in the rainforest is rich biodiversity. The animals have been pushed closer together and many of them pushed out into closer contact with people. And that produces one environment where a virus or a bacteria can jump from an animal to a person. Then we've been hunting them, killing them and eating them. And hunters have been going deeper and deeper into the forest. And the bushmeat markets in Africa, for example, which is where HIV, uh, HIV AIDS came from butchering chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. And then we've also been trafficking animals, that is, capturing them and selling them or their parts illegally around the world. Many have ended up in the wildlife uh, markets in Asia, 
um, China, but many other Asian countries too, where animals from different regions, different countries are crowded together in definitely cruel, but also unsanitary conditions. And this COVID-19 is thought to have begun when uh, one of these animals infected a person, one person, and when the virus can bond with a human cell, it can create a new disease. That new disease may be one like COVID-19 that can infect uh, other humans. And this one has been extraordinary in the speed with which it raised around the world. But it's not just Africa and Asia, and of course Latin America also sells animals in markets. But the, the um, factory farms, of, that have sprung up all around the world where billions and billions of animals, cows, pigs, poultry, are put in terrible conditions. And again, that provides an ideal environment and many diseases have spilled over from an animal in a factory farm to a human. And it's happening a lot in Germany right now with this COVID-19. So that's what I mean when I say that in part, we, we have brought this upon ourselves. And the question is going to be, what, what lessons will we have learned? Will we learn from it? Or will, as so many leaders seem to want, business leaders, government leaders, dying to get back to business as usual. And if we continue with business as usual, I don't see very much future for our species in the long run on this planet. <laughs> Yes, that is indeed such a such an important um, issue right now, right this minute. And you mentioned that uh, you know the business leaders are so keen to start the economies, but you also mentioned that uh, one of the problems is uh, that we are so focused on financial capital. So I want to just say that at Asia Initiative, we are very much uh, uh, researching and focused on. Um, how the financial capital and social capital and ecological capital should be all seen together in a holistic way and all projects should really be evaluated on the basis of all these three capitals so the triple bottom line accounting so i want to ask uh, secretary general that uh, you know after the plague in europe in uh, uh, 14th century came the renaissance because people were shocked into thinking in a new way. So it was like a fresh breeze. So my question to you is, do you think COVID-19 can also lead to a new paradigm that can uh, help heal our planet and our humanity? Uh, I met uh, Pope Francis in April, 2018. He told me, uh, he told me that God, God always forgives. Human being sometimes forgives, but nature never forgives. This is exactly the same message he has been uh, you know, sending out to, to us. I think we have to do something uh, very clearly and listen to the voices of the nature. I believe uh, we can also should remember that we should build back better, but greener and in a more inclusive manner. Encouragingly, uh, many countries are prioritizing uh, such policies in their COVID-19 recoveries. Uh, the Korean government, uh, for example, is uh, working out the details of a Green New Deal. And they, uh, during the recent European Union summit meeting, uh, just a few days ago, European leaders committed 1.82 trillion dollars out of which one third out of which money will be devoted to climate action and neutrality. I think this is uh, exactly the right thing to do. I have been urging, even though I'm no longer second general, I have been urging to world leaders and business leaders saying that, that it is important to uh, take whatever, me whatever measures, financial uh, support to resuscitate, to recover uh, from this uh, COVID-19, uh, but never 
put this acrimidation into the back seat, into the back seat. But there is a tendency already. So just the people use a tremendous and astronomical amount of money, uh, but not just the sum of this uh, budget should be used uh, in addressing climate uh, action. Building this uh, new system uh, cannot come from policymakers alone. I think uh, so social leaders, business leaders, and all global citizens uh, must fight together uh, for a more sustainable and equitable world. As you are from India, I like to quote some very famous uh, Indian novelist, uh, Arundhati Roy. Yes. This recently wrote in a powerful Financial Times essay, and I quote, I quote, the pandemic is a portal. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcass, carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with a little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So end of the quote. Yes, she is actually one of my heroes also. Uh, and she's so articulate in how she says this. Uh, but uh, you both have been, uh, you know, you are world leaders and you are promoting this on the policy level, at the government levels. Uh, but Secretary General, you also said that we need to do it at the micro level as well. And that is actually what Asia Initiatives is doing uh, with our community currency for social good, which we call SOX, uh, because we incentivize, uh, for example, uh, students to uh, help in reforesting for farmers to switch to organic agriculture and to save water and for women to start micro enterprises. And uh, uh, so I want to ask Dr. Goodall that, uh, you know, with the Jane Goodall Institute and Roots and Shoots, your other organization you founded, uh, give us some examples of the work you are doing that we can learn from. Okay, well, um... Let me say that uh, it was very wonderful to hear those words read out because clearly we're all thinking the same. This is a discussion of people who, who feel the same. And, you know, I couldn't agree more. We need to come out of this uh, and develop a new green economy. And what so many people refuse to realize is that a green economy can offer hundreds of thousands of jobs if governments will only subsidize clean green energy and stop this love affair with fossil fuel, mm -hmm. uh, fossil fuel companies. So, and, and the other thing I think we need whilst on that subject is a new definition of success. I mean, at the moment, success in most people's minds is tied up with making money, getting power, developing your business so it gets bigger and bigger and gobbles up the smaller businesses, leaving people out of jobs, um, making goods so cheap that the people who are producing the jobs are not paid properly or it's child slave labor from somewhere. So that's how we need to move away from the pandemic into a new future. And it does need everybody. Time I learned so much about the problems faced by so many African people living in and around chimpanzee habitat, the crippling poverty, the lack of good health, good education um, systems, and the degradation of the land as human populations grew. And when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park where I'd done, and we still are continuing our research, it was initially part of the equatorial forest belt that stretched right across Africa in the equatorial region. Um, by 1990, when I flew over in a small plane, Gombe was a tiny island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills. And that's when it hit me. If we don't do something to help the people find ways of making a living without destroying the environment, we can't even try to save the chimps. And this is where it becomes so important to alleviate poverty because if you're really poor, 
you're going to cut down the last trees to try and grow more food or to make charcoal. And so the Jane Goodall Institute, JGI, we began our program, Take Care or Takari, which is very holistic. And one of the interventions that I think was really important was microcredit. And this was based on the Grameen Bank because Mohammed Yunus, who's one of my heroes, took me to Bangladesh and I met women whose lives were changed when they got the first tiny little loan. And you know, when it's microcredit and the, the people have to pay back, when they pay back, and nearly all of our groups do, they're proud, it's theirs, they, it's their hard work. It was their idea, it was their project that was funded. And so it's so different from just handing out a grant. And you finish the grant and you put your hand out and expect another one. But if it's your hard work, then you can get another grant and you can develop it. And at the same time, the women were anxious to learn about family planning because they didn't want to be just birth machines. They wanted to space out their children. And so we provided um, family planning information, which was received well by the men too, because culture changes. And we also provided as many scholarships as we could to keep girls in school during and beyond puberty. Because all around the world, it's been shown as women's education improves, family size tends to drop. And so it's begun. What the program that we began in the 12 villages around Gombe is now in 104 villages throughout the whole of the Chimp Range. And the people have now become our partners in conservation because they understand that saving the forest, saving the environment, isn't just for wildlife. It's for them and their future. They need the forest. They need the clean air and clean water. They need the forest to regulate the temperature and the rainfall. And so this program is now in six other African countries in and around chimp habitat and everywhere it's working and everywhere we're empowering women and everywhere we're trying to keep girls in school and give them at least secondary education. And it's working. Um, that's wonderful advice and wonderful words. And you will be pleased to know that Asia Initiatives is now uh, working with several governments. And although we are called Asia Initiatives, we are actually working worldwide. Uh, we have worked with the uh, mayor of uh, a town in, in, in Costa Rica. We are working with some state governments who want to see our models of social capital credits incentivizing social good for personal good also. And uh, so um, I think that that really has to be scaled up. But on a micro level, actually, we have what we call uh, water governance bodies at village level, and they are women run. Actually, the Indian uh, constitution now uh, requires that every elected body have 33% women. Uh, so, but a lot of times it's not actually happening or effective. So we are helping our women to actually become strong leaders. I completely agree with you that that's, that will bring a big change in the environment and, and every other way also. And, and doesn't this tie in perfectly with improved education for yes. women? because we don't want women in a high position just because they're women. We want them there because their skills are equal or superior to those of their male colleagues. And that's always a danger when you make a rule. Oh, this, is, this is great. I mean, look at the countries that have done well in COVID-19. A lot of women-headed uh, countries have actually done very well. So no, please keep talking. And actually, I also want you, Dr. Goodall, to uh, talk about Gombe 60. Gombe 60. Well, um, well, Gombe 60, you know, I began the research on chimpanzees in 1960. And although I left living there permanently in 1986, uh, the research team has continued. It's uh, mostly Tanzanians now because we believe that this is important in the different countries where we work. And so 60 years of unbroken study on one species. We're saying the longest study of this sort on chimpanzees, but it's certainly on apes. And apart from the Japanese monkeys, I think it's 
the longest study of any animal anywhere ever. So we're, we're very proud of that and all that's been accomplished by our research teams, how it's helped us understand human evolution, as well as learning more about the chimpanzees and their cultures around, around the planet. So that's, that's going to be 60. And of course, we had big plans. We were going to have galas around the world and use it for fundraising because we always need funds. But of course, <laughs> the pandemic put that on hold anyway. But I've, uh, I've, that we, we created a virtual Jane. And the virtual Jane has been way more busy than I've ever been in my whole life. Non-stop events like we're doing now <laughs> since, since lockdown began until the present. But Roots and Shoots, which is my passion, uh, it brings everything together. And I began it because I was meeting so many young people, kind of high school, university, as I was traveling around the world lecturing, uh, who seemed to have lost hope. And they were depressed, they were angry, and most of them just not seeming to care, just apathetic. And when I asked, you know, why do you feel like this? They all said more or less the same, because you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, we've not only compromised their future, we've been stealing it. And we're still stealing it today. But were they right when they said there was nothing they could do? No, we have a window of time. And if you lose hope, you give up. I mean, what, if you don't think that anything you do or anybody does can make a difference, why bother? Eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. No, so we have this window. It is closing, but we have it. And so Roots and Shoots began with 12 high school students in Tanzania with the main message, every single one of us makes some impact on the planet every single day. And unless we're very poor, we get to choose what sort of impact we make. What do we buy? Where did it come from? Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of child slave labor? Something like that. But because I'd learned about the interconnectedness of life, in the rainforest, uh, we decided that each group, and we were going to work in groups like clubs, they call them in Africa, uh, would choose three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And today it's in 65 countries and growing. It has been in some others, but you know, sometimes uh, it's in a, only a small number and the leader moves countries or dies or something, but the seeds have been planted. So we have members in kindergarten, university, everything in between. Some staff of big corporations have formed Roots and Shoots groups and it works in prisons. It's magic when it's in prisons because the prisoners feel empowered. So the, uh, the Roots and Shoots program one thing that's come out of it, which is why Kofi Annan asked me to be a messenger of peace, by bringing the young people together as much as possible face to face, but usually virtually because it's too expensive face to face, you know, using mileage and stuff. Um, they've come to understand that the color of your skin, your language, your country, your culture, your religion is much less significant than the fact that we're all human beings. Mm -hmm. Our blood is the same, our tears are the same. We love having that wonderful feeling. Uh, our sense of humor may be a little bit different, but we still have it and we laugh. And so it's breaking down the barriers that we've built between countries, nations, religions, cultures, and is that not important today, breaking down the barriers between religions in particular, all these fanaticists who distorted religions? Mm -hmm. They're not like that. Every single religion shares the same golden rule, do to others as you would have them do to you. And in, in our book, we include the animals too. So that's what Roots and Shoots is all about. And the alumni call them that, the ones who you know, began in 91, they're now out in the big wide world and they retain the values they developed in the Roots and Shoots program, which we didn't even teach them. They get to choose their projects and they retain those values. So in China, 
when I, when I'm there, I've been visiting first once a year and then the once every two years. People come up and say, well, of course I care about the environment and animals. I was in your Roots and Chutes program in primary school. So it's creating change in society, but perhaps even more important, it's creating change in the individual's lives. And I say that because hundreds of them have told me Roots and Chutes changed my life. Would you like to just say one, one line each to inspire our young people? We've been Asia's initiative uh, work trying to uh, find the women leader uh, to inspire other women so that they can be empowered. And this is what I'm doing. Now I think we have to work much more for women and youth who are, I think, our leaders in the future. Let us work together to make this world better for all. And also for every young person to remember and every adult too, that every day we live, we make some kind of impact on the planet and it's up to us to choose an ethical impact. So thank you so much for this fascinating morning. Thank you, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Uh, today, uh, I am extremely honored uh, and proud to confer the 2020 Ban Ki-moon Award for Women's Empowerment uh, to such an impressive and legendary honoree, uh, Dr. Jane Kudal. Congratulations, my warmest of congratulations. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm so honored. Thank you very much. I'm sure you do. And uh, continue good success uh, and good health, uh, particularly Dr. Gudan and also uh, Dr. Meta. And uh, continue this uh, very important work. Thank you very much. Thank so, you so much to both of you. I'm most grateful for this amazing, inspiring conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All our projects are pro-women, pro-poor, and pro-environment. Now, let's hear a few words from some of our board members and host committee members who have found meaning in working with us. Hi, I'm Yusai Khan. I am proud to say that Gloria Steinem, Even Heller, and I were the first recipients of the Ban Ki-moon Award presented by Asia Initiatives. Being associated with a great man like Ban Ki-moon is such an enormous honor but I also love and support Asia initiatives because of their work to empowering women to empower communities. Their transformative method called SOCCS, S-O-C-C-S, is helping thousands of people in four continents. Their concept of social capital credits won the MIT Inclusive Innovative Challenge last year and has been recognized the world-changing idea this year. Congratulations! Go Asia Initiatives, go. I support Asia Initiatives because the highly motivated team uses innovative social capital credits to uplift whole communities, in particular, women and children. Support Asia Initiatives. Our life depends on it. We want to create a sense of community in the entire universe. And Asia Initiative does that in small communities, in large ones. In first world, second world, or third world, there is always a niche and always a need for Asia Initiative. So come join us. I support Asia Initiatives because Asia Initiatives gives a hand up, not a hand out, to the families and communities it supports. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi. We are Groupman the community platform for nonprofit organizations. We built a custom mobile app to help support Asia Initiatives goals. We support Asia Initiatives because we believe that empowering communities with the best technologies is a key driver for positive change. We hope you all enjoy your first virtual gala. I'm a longtime supporter of Asia Initiatives. I love how the SOX concept leverages my investment, bringing more goodness into the world. Asia Initiatives is close to my heart because of the impactful work they do to serve the underserved globally. I am so incredibly proud and honored to be part of such a great cause. 
I would now like to share another short video about how Asia Initiatives is responding to COVID-19 challenges, bringing hope to people in our projects most impacted by the pandemic. We not only provide immediate humanitarian assistance, but also have engaged hundreds of people who had lost jobs to build long-term resilience projects that will make their communities and villages more water and food secure. The impact of COVID-19 on the underserved communities that Asia Initiatives works with has been devastating and urgent. We knew we had to respond immediately to the humanitarian crisis in our, all our sites, and so we did. Asia Initiatives rolled out several projects and programs shown in this video. Besides health, the main COVID-19 crisis has been that most daily wage earners have lost their jobs and means to meet their family needs. This was the situation in India and Kenya. In some of our projects, the local partners innovated and used socks to incentivize their members to reach out to their communities in providing correct information about the virus and distributing food supplies. Within days of the lockdowns, Asia Initiatives was not only providing urgent food and medical support, but with our local partners, we also planned some long-term resilience projects that are hiring hundreds of people. These projects include building rainwater harvesting trenches, pond desilting, well recharging, and tree planting to help drought prone areas become water and food secure, reducing the need for people to migrate to cities for jobs. In other projects, we are helping people build or repair local infrastructure for long-term poverty alleviation. This will allow for the communities to use their resources for more sustainability. Loan repayments have been postponed in our programs in which socks have been redeemed for our micro poultry or micro dairy projects with very low interest loans. Since poor communities suffer the most from any health or climate shock, we have always focused on helping communities build resilience. Our insistence that every self-help group member save regularly in the bank and that every family grow a kitchen garden is coming in very useful now. In Kibera, Nairobi, Asia Initiatives is supporting vertical kitchen gardens for families who no longer have resources to buy fresh vegetables for their meals. We are also supporting the education of children in underprivileged areas in India where the schools have closed with our unique Socks Buddy program. 40 volunteers are providing lesson help to students via online Zoom and Google Meet sessions. Since many children do not have access to smartphones, our local partner staff deliver laptops to students for a few hours a day on a rotational basis and also help their families with information about government programs and many more. We are also working with our working women on a program in which our Sox buddies from the Geek League are helping formerly incarcerated women in New York City continue their education and computer training so their preparation to re-enter the job market or start their small enterprise is not interrupted. Above all, Asia Initiatives helps people come together to strengthen their social capital, which is the overarching goal of all of our projects and the best resilient strategy to face pandemics or climate shocks that may come along in the future too. People in our projects have shown amazing resilience and community spirit in such challenging times, which is a continued source of inspiration for Asia Initiatives. I also want to tell you that every dollar you donate today has a multiplier effect. This is because of our special methodology of social capital credits, which we call SOX. People earn SOX by helping their community. They then use these credits for education, microloans, or access to health care, so the impact of every dollar raised today will be multiplied. The video you just saw shows why our host committee and board members are so enthusiastic about supporting us. I hope what you heard and saw today has increased your understanding about our commitment to a better world for all of us. I'm also excited to tell you about our silent auction with some fabulous items at never-to-be-found-again prices. These items include things that you can do with social distancing, or collectibles, or travel experiences redeemable within the next three years. Please do take a look. The auction closes on August 23rd. 
You all should have received the link to the auction site when you registered, but I'm adding it on this screen as well. Finally, to close the program, we are so excited to have Ricky Cage, a Grammy Award winner, a UNICEF celebrity supporter, and Asia Initiative's Goodwill Ambassador perform for us. Thank you, Ricky. Hello, everyone. Namaste. Hola. Now, as many of you already know, I love what the Asia Initiatives does, and I'm passionate about using my music to promote environmental consciousness. I'm delighted and honored to be here with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the amazing Jane Goodall, my heroes. So here is a song about solidarity, a song about kindness, a song about being the change that we all want to see. And joining me are Lonnie Park from New York, I.P. Singh from Mumbai, the Zanzi Youth Choir all the way from South Africa. My song is called Shine Your Light. It's time, let's do this, it's our time, let's do this, it is time to shine your light, let's do this, it is time to shine your light. We only protect things that we love, so we should all make it our mission to make everyone fall in love with the natural world, and hopefully through that love, we will clean, protect, and conserve. It is time to shine your light. Main jo saath nibhaye, tu jo saath nibhaye, to baat ban jaye, to ye raat dhal jaye. Chalo haath badhaye, chalo sab ko dikhaye, koi bhi yaha akela. that we inflict on the environment and nature is pain and suffering that will eventually be inflicted on us as a species and we need to start thinking as a species from our ancestors, but we borrow it from our children. 